Welcome to the Austin Mustard Seed Midweek Group Scrimmage for Fall 2014. My name is Chris Morton, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about what we hope not just midweek groups, but Austin Mustard Seed as a church community will become in the uh, season ahead of us, and what it's been, where we've come from, and kind of how we hope to get there and why we think this will work out. So let's start by talking about how our first season of midweek groups from 2013 and 2014 went. We did a little survey and had a full 10 participants of this survey, and here's what they told us. When we asked, how has participating in this group affected your spiritual life? 70% said that it deeply affected them. 30% said somewhat, not bad. When we asked, how often did you attend your group? Most people said regularly, 60%. 30% said when possible, and 10% said on occasion. When we asked, how often did your group hang out unofficially? 70% said on occasion, 30% said regularly. When we asked how well organized was the group, 80% said well organized, 20% said confusing. Finally, we asked how easy was it to feel like a part of the group? 100% said people were immediately welcoming and embracing. When we had this presentation in person, we asked the question, what do you love about Austin Mustard Seed? Here are the answers that we received. A few were intentionality, easy to connect. People were actively helping each other. There's a high level of trust. People were immediately invited into small groups. People talk to each other. Parents talk to non-parents. Married people talk to single people. And it's easy to get to know people's names. Those are pretty good things. So this leaves us with a question. How can Austin Mustard Seed continue to get better at what we do while maintaining what we love? Well, we want to spend the next couple of moments in this presentation talking about some ideas just about how people work and how groups of people work that'll help us understand why we love what we love about Austin Mustard Seed and how we can continue to do it. So this first slide here is based on the idea of proxemics. Now proxemics is a social science about how people interact with each other in different physical spaces. Basic idea is that no matter it, that in different types of settings we interact with people differently and that we literally stand at a different space from them so you can tell that someone feels close to someone because they stand close they don't stand quite as close in personal space it's a little different in social space and we've all been to the concert or stuck in line in public space where we get stuck closer than we would like. So we do believe there is a value of what space are we inhabiting? Are we creating a environment where we can act in the different social spaces, personal spaces, and intimate spaces that allow for discipleship to happen? And the second idea we want to talk about comes from the concept of the Dunbar, the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number basically says that humans interact with each other in, in different settings, in different sizes. You have families, extended families, tribes, and crowds. And this is a loose approximation of the idea of the Dunbar number. But basically, the idea is that somewhere around 150 we kind of tap out how many relationships we can handle. It's hard for us to really know and interact with and 
feel like we recognize and care about more than about 150 people. Anything above that is kind of just a crowd of strangers. Now within that, we have our personal families, those whom we're really close to, and our extended families. At least in most cultures you do. In the United States and other industrialized cultures, the extended family has uh, become, become something of a problem. People move to big cities to get jobs, move away from grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles, and are stuck with just their immediate family. And I think we all know and have experienced that, that this causes a lot of stress on people. And so there is something really valuable to creating opportunities, not just for the tribe, but also to do life as an extended family. So to go back to our question, how will Austin Mustard Seed continue to grow in this season while maintaining what we love? Well, we'll continue to succeed at what we love about our community today by purposefully multiplying this, these extended families, which we'll call mid-sized groups from here forward, and tribes, which we'll call congregations. So let's talk a little bit more about what mid-sized communities are and why we love them. There are three reasons we love mid-sized communities, three things that we believe they're very ideal for. The first is belonging. A mid-sized community helps fulfill our need for an extended family, which is often missing in our culture. And as we have this larger sense of community beyond just our small group or our nuclear family, I feel like we really are a part of something. And people fill that space, that need for aunts and uncles. You know, we believe this existed in scripture as well, that in the time of Jesus, that many families were organized into what was called the oikos, this an extended family in Hellenistic culture. And we know that the church spread often by in the conversion of an entire oikos. There's just something about that sense of having family and belonging. The second reason we love mid-sized communities is that they are ideal for a sense of ownership. Mid-sized communities are organized but not professionalized. And because of their size, it really gives everyone an opportunity to serve. Sometimes in a small group, it's, it's hard because they're uh, if, if you want to be a, if you're extroverted and want to be a part of a big party, um, that might never happen. Or if you have really good organizational skills, there's not too much to organize. On the other hand, in a really large group, only the best of the best get to do things. And usually you have to pay them to do it. A mid-sized community is really an opportunity for everyone to find their place. Finally, we love mid-sized communities because we believe they're ideal for mission. Mid-sized communities are large enough to care and share. Maybe what's missing on the slide we should say also add the word dare. Care, share, and dare. They're, they're just the right size to care for each other. So if, um, let's say someone in your mid-sized community is pregnant, you've got this whole group of 30, 40, 50 people who can take care of them, who can provide meals after the baby comes, uh, who can provide babysitting for older siblings. If all you had to rely on is your small group, you'd probably wear them out pretty fast. Mid-sized communities are great for sharing. You're going to come up with resources that you wouldn't have in a small group that would be uh, too hard to organize and too bureaucratic in a larger group. And finally, they're great for mission because you can do things together in a way that's really hard with a super large group or a super small group. In a big group, it's really hard to do something like a service project or to throw a party for your friends who don't know Jesus. In a mid-sized community, it's a natural 
environment to go and do things together to invite other people into. We love mid-sized communities because they're ideal for belonging, ideal for ownership, and ideal for mission. So what does a healthy midweek group look like? Well, one way to think about ministry in general and churches in general and even your own spiritual life is that a healthy spiritual person or organization or church is going to have three components. We like to call these components up, in, and out. The up component is our relationship with God. This is seen in things like worship and prayer and spiritual disciplines. Our in component is our life together, is how we love each other as a church community, care for one another. And our out component is how we serve, is the mission that we're sent on, the people that God is sending us to, to represent Jesus in this world, our mission, up, in, and out, the three components of a healthy midweek group. A healthy church in general, really. So a midweek group really is able to do the in component best. It's like we said before, you have that sense of belonging. They're also really good at doing the out component. It's easier for a midweek group to find persons of peace, as Jesus describes in Luke 10. Persons of peace are those people who are maybe their co-workers or a friend from a local coffee shop or pub. And uh, they're the kind of people who are easy to get to know and quickly invite you into their group of friends. Midweek groups are great at encouraging each other to find people of peace and inviting people of peace into your unstructured events, which we'll talk about in a minute and uh, seeking them out together. A healthy midweek group has a good balance of organized and organic events. Another way to put this might be structured and less structured or even unstructured gatherings. We'd like to encourage our midweek groups to have a minimum of two gatherings every month that are organized. And we'll talk about that in a moment, some ways of organizing. And we'd also encourage them to be purposeful about having organic gatherings. Just things that are fun, that you put together, maybe don't have as much structure, but are just as rich. Finally, a healthy midweek group multiplies. You're inviting new people in, Persons of peace are being found and invited in, and the group is growing and multiplying. Now, part of multiplying, too, is by purposefully finding and identifying leaders and apprentice leaders who can grow the group and lead it as it multiplies. So to summarize, let's think about where Mustard Seed has been and where we're going. For the first season, really kind of the, our, our year together since last fall when we launched, we focused on what we've called liturgy and life together. That's just quite simply getting our Sunday liturgy organized and getting where we do that on a regular basis and, and, and gather well and everyone gets to participate. And then life together is just kind of coming to know each other and like each other. That's our first season. Now, where are we going? Where do we hope this lands? Well, it would be that we would land where we are disciples of Jesus on a mission together. Disciples of Jesus on a mission together. So how do we get there? That's really the season we're in right now. Well, we do that by developing a discipleship culture. We've already started doing this. We do this in our liturgy on Sundays by practicing praying together, by practicing confessing together. We did this recently on a Sunday by practicing Lectio Divina, 
which is an ancient practice of listening to the scriptures. We've also practiced this in our story nights, where we have talked to each other and heard people's stories and helped to listen to the Spirit of God and ask, what is God calling us to do and what are we going to do about it? And we're continuing to figure this out. We're continuing to develop a discipleship culture within our church. And as we become disciples, as that just becomes a natural part of who we are together, God is going to call us on mission, call us to do things both in our own personal vocations and as a community. So another way of phrasing this, season one would be that we build a community. Season two is that, that as a community, we learned how to be a community of disciples. And seasons three, season three is that we're a community of disciples on God's mission together. So let's get real specific about fall 2014. How do we get from here, where we are today, to there, to that group of disciples on mission together? Well, we do it by including our new friends. We've had a lot of great friendly faces show up on Sundays, and that's been exciting. And so we have to find ways to include them. It'll be a simple way is to make sure you get to go to lunch and get to know people or hang out at midweek meetups. But we also need to be really purposeful about inviting them into our midweek groups. Second, we can, we're going to continue to develop our discipleship approach. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment, some of the things we'll do in midweek groups. And thirdly, this fall, we want to focus on praying about mission. We want to spend time in every midweek group gathering, praying that God will reveal to us the persons of peace that are in our path whom we can share the gospel with. So let's actually get to our scrimmage. This is when we ask the questions, when do groups meet, where do they meet, and who's in the groups? Well, the question when Right now, we're going to have a, two groups on Tuesday and a group on Wednesday. And you can check the website to learn more about where they meet and who facilitates these groups. That leads us to the question, what, groups sh what should groups do together? Now, it was really interesting. We asked in our survey what people think their groups should do. Uh, what we found is people really like spiritual disciplines, or at least the idea of spiritual disciplines. <laughs> they really like to eat. Not as crazy about evangelism or spending time in scripture. Which is interesting. I think on one hand, it's really great that people want to be together and people want to practice spiritual disciplines. But also it probably shows us an area that we need to be open to learning and being changed and, and recognizing we have some room for growth. We need to learn how to share the gospel and be comfortable with evangelism. So here are a few things that you can actually do in the group together. I want to give you three basic ideas of what you do in your organized time and then some actual tools to do it. So the first is learning, listening, and the third is Lectio Divina. And we have three options for learning that we want to suggest. The first is a book called The Tangible Kingdom Primer. And this is to really help your midweek community really kind of learn what it is to really know that God is among you and working and sending you on a mission. For groups that know they need to grow in their sense of finding persons of peace and being sent on mission together, this is a key book. The second one we want to suggest is the story of God and the story of us. And this is, comes in both video and in book form. And this is an incredible tool for really understanding scripture as a story 
And if you've never done that, if you've never really understood the full, the whole of Scripture, if you don't know how to tell someone else a story of Scripture, this is a great place to start. We want to be people who know our story and know our God's story, and this is a great tool for that. Our third learning suggestion we have is the video series, The Work of the People, and that's available online. You get some great videos there with leading scholars like N.T. Wright and Walter Brueggemann and Parker Palmer. People and videos that are really going to challenge uh, what you believe and what God is calling you to be. So those are some things if you want to learn. The second thing is if you want to listen. And by listening, we're, we're really learning to listen to each other and learning to listen to God, both the voice of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and the voice of the Spirit through Scripture. And so we spent our summer doing this thing called Summer Story Nights, where we learned to ask these two questions. What is God telling me, and what am I going to do about it? And on the website, you'll find a, an, an updated version of the Story Night Guide that will show you how to continue to ask each other and share stories with each other. And we'll also teach you how to do that with the actual tool, with the actual stories of Scripture. So you can actually take those same questions, read a passage of the Bible, and work together through as a group. What is God telling me? What am I going to do about it? This is also a great tool just to hear each other's stories and help people work through interesting or powerful or difficult moments in their lives. Finally, the third, or the third option is Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina is an ancient tool for listening to Scripture. And you'll find this guide on the website as well. You basically read a passage over four times. The first time you listen to it and look for a word or phrase that grabs your attention. The second time you read the passage as a group and you meditate. You really focus on those words, and you consider the question, what does this mean from God's point of view? The third time you read it, and then you share with each other, what were the words or phrases that stood out to you? And then again, we have these questions. What is God telling you, and what are you going to do about it? Then you end by reading a fourth time and savoring, resting, enjoying the passage, listening without agenda, and knowing that God loves you. So what now? Well, we're going to start our first groups on the first week of, I'm sorry, the second week of September 2014. And in our first week, we hope our groups will do two things. The first is that they'll determine uh, which of the three approaches they're going to take for the fall, either learning, listening, or Lectio Divina. Or, and, and I'm sorry, once they've done that, they'll also, as a group, come up with what we're calling an identity statement. An identity statement is your group working together to answer the question, why does this group do what it does, and how will we know when we've accomplished it? Why does this group do what it does, and how will we know when we've accomplished it? So we appreciate you listening, and we hope you have a great fall in your midweek group. God bless.